Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm very happy to have you. You're welcome to come down to the table if you would like, or if you're going to try to make an early escape. Uh, <laughs> we, we wouldn't hold that against you. Uh, but uh, uh, I want to welcome you to uh, do this morning especially uh, because I, this is a presentation I think that you'll find fascinating, uh, but also it's one that's very, very dear to our hearts because the two people up here with me at the podium are very close friends, and we've worked many, many years together, and, and it's, it's really fun to have them here and talking about uh, the work that we've done in Burundi and the Congo. Uh, as you know, the Woodrow Wilson Center was established in 1968 as a monument to a uh, living monument to President Wilson, and the idea was to bring together the the worlds of ideas and and and, and policy. Uh, and I think what we're talking about today is, is there's no better example of of that uh, synergy. Uh, we will be being uh, addressed by by two. Uh, practitioners in the field in conflict transformation, conflict resolution, con conflict, conflict mitigation, uh, who really uh, have brought the worlds of policy and ideas to the field, to, uh, 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 to, to, to the people uh, where it's really needed. Um, I'll introduce them in just a moment uh, as, as uh, we get ready to make our, uh, our uh, presentation. We do want this to be mostly a, a dialogue, a conversation, uh, so we're going to try to make it kind of short up here, give you all plenty of time to ask questions to see where your interests lie. Um, but just a quick word of, uh, of uh, uh, introduction on the program. Uh, many, if not most of you, know this, but the, the project that we have, projects that we've been working on in Burundi and the DRC uh, with Liz and Alain as our primary facilitators, um, uh, all initiated from uh, from our director here at the Africa program, Howard Wolpe. Uh, now, Howard, as most of you know, was a special envoy to the Great Lakes region uh, uh, during the Clinton administration. As many of you probably don't know, uh, Howard had several lives before that, one in Congress that you probably know about, but he was also uh, an academic for many years before he went into public life, and uh, his mother was a clinical psychologist. And he helped her in doing work in racially divided communities in, in the United States, starting in, in Detroit and Michigan uh, during the civil rights era when some of the unrest and riots were going on, and moving that work down into uh, uh, to the South, in South Carolina, North Carolina. Um, and he saw there the amazing uh, power and impact of what uh, uh, conflict transformation work can do uh, within a community divided on racial lines. And flashing forward many, many years when he was coming out of uh, the administration, uh, he had been a prime player in the Arusha peace accords for Burundi and in the Sun City and the Lusaka processes for the DRC. And uh, he realized, in fact, he more than realized because he tried along the way in Burundi in particular to do some facilitation of this kind with the protagonists in the Burundi process. The State Department, who he represented, had agreed to that, but President Nyeri, who was then the facilitator before his death, uh, would not agree to allowing this process to happen. I don't think he understood it. He also was very wary of any kind of second track or, or other kind of negotiation process or mediation process, which he saw as interference with his own. He felt he had been burned by the, uh, by the rome Santa Gidio process that had gone on in secret. Uh, so he wouldn't allow uh, Howard in the State Department to go forward with this kind of training at that time. Uh, so when Howard left the administration in 2000, 2001 and was doing some work for the World Bank, um, he again mentioned uh, this possibility, uh, and the World Bank was receptive. Things were not going well in the transition in Burundi, and uh, they asked him to bring together a proposal to bring to them for doing some uh, work with the leaders of Burundi. Now, the idea, as is outlined in some of the um, documents that you have outside that Howard and I and, and the team here wrote earlier, the idea is that coming out of any conflict situation, you have sort of four imperatives. One of them is that all relationships have been broken. Uh, trust has been broken. Uh, uh, there, uh, the second one is that uh, there's no communications. I mean, communications are, are really uh, on a protagonistic level and not, uh, not constructive communications. Uh, then there's no uh, uh, no uh, real agreement on the rules of the game on how power is to be shared, how uh, how a, a, uh, any kind of uh, potential uh, uh, 
um, ongoing governance process will be uh, be organized or managed. Uh, and therefore, uh, in the Burundi situation, uh, he felt that until you got that kind of rebuilding of trust, of communications, of, uh, of relationships, until you got people able to work together, uh, there would be no sustaining of the peace agreement, no sustaining of anything else that you needed to happen after that, whether it's development, whether it's poverty reduction, whether it's, whether it's good governance. Um, and uh, and uh, he asked me to come on board with him at that point in time to write this proposal to present to the bank, which they accepted. Um, now, that was the beginning of this work, uh, but the real beginning was our first trips out to, uh, to Burundi and to the region to meet with uh, all of the uh, protagonists, including all the armed faction leaders who were at that point in time still at war and were located in Tanzania or Kenya or South Africa, or sometimes leaders were still in Europe at that point in time. But we went and we consulted with over a over hundred leaders, all government uh, in Burundi, uh, uh, the president uh, and, and his key uh, leaders, including the chief of staff of the army and others, all of the uh, armed faction leaders. And the important thing of launching the process, of course, was to get a total buy-in uh, from, uh, from the leadership element that we thought that we wanted to deal with. Um, it took us about three months of uh, uh, trips back and forth uh, to the region and to Burundi, talking with all these parties to get that buy-in um, and, and to get their, uh, their uh, understanding of an agreement to be uh, involved in the process. Uh, in fact, the way we really got uh, them to come uh, and, and, and we selected the leaders that we, uh, that we brought into our first leadership group of about 100 Burundians at, at, at the top level was to ask them to tell us who they thought were keys to the future of Burundi. And we were very specific to say uh, people who you thought could help the process, help the, uh, the transition to democracy, and people who you thought would be stumbling blocks to the democracy because we felt very strongly, sometimes against the advice of, uh, of uh, diplomats and others on, uh, on the ground at the time, that if you didn't bring the spoilers into the process, then you would, uh, then you would uh, be missing a, a very, very key element. Uh, and uh, then we also uh, had to, uh, to look at the establishment of a presence of our own on the ground, and we wanted that to be Burundian-led, obviously, and uh, it, it, it would have a very practical function of, of logistics and administration that we would need for, uh, for uh, managing this program, but also to give us the Burundian perspective. Uh, we began by working with someone who I think many in this room probably know, I know Rick does, uh, 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 Eugene Nderera, who was a former minister of uh, human rights, uh, uh, in the Burundian government, and was one of the few Burundians that you knew at that time who who really had an overarching view, was trusted by all sides, uh, who uh, uh, who uh, uh, we felt gave us uh, kind of the neutral presence, but also the gravitas and 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 the and the analytical abilities that we needed uh, from our Burundian uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, we selected. Uh, uh, he helped us to select uh, our actual uh, office head there, the director of what is now called the Burundi Leader. Training um, uh, program (BLTP) uh, Fabian Insinkimana, who had been working in the president's office, but uh, but was a teacher and administrator in schools and, and hospitals in the, in the country before, and was uh, was a, a great administrator, and also uh, had this same rather neutral and uh, and trusted uh, 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 reputation in the society. Uh, so then we launched the program. Uh, now, I won't go through any more of the history of it because I'm breaking my own rules saying we're not going to spend too much time up here. But the whole point of today is to, to introduce you to the two people who really, really made it possible. Uh, Howard and I set the stage. We, uh, we were able to bring the, 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 uh, to, to, to bring the right people to the table, which is a critical thing. Your, your entry point, uh, being sure you have the right people at the table, is, 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 is key to having any successful process. Process, but then the process itself is, is what we want to talk about today, and we have our, our two key facilitators. Uh, when Howard and I were designing the, uh, the, the proposal that went to the World Bank, we knew we had a good idea. Howard had this 
feeling from long ago when he had worked in racially divided communities in the United States that it would work, but we had never done conflict resolution training. So the first thing we did uh, was to go visit with this lady here, Liz McClintock, uh, who at that time was uh, was the program director, I think, for conflict management uh, group, mm-hmm. uh, a group that had been started by Roger Fisher uh, and uh, was uh, deeply involved in doing uh, uh, conflict resolution training through that group uh, uh, in the Harvard Negotiations Project. Um, and and Liz then brought us to Alain Lampereur, who also uh, had uh, studied under Roger Fisher, as I recall, and uh, and was uh, was uh, teaching at Harvard and was at uh, uh, in Paris at uh, at the Essex Business School. Uh, I'll do a little more of their bio in just a moment. Uh, but uh, when we had our very first training in March of nineteen uh, two thousand and three, good lord, uh, uh, Alain and uh, and Liz were our co facilitators for the training, and uh, uh, they have stayed with us ever since. Uh, Liz uh, basically taking over as the lead facilitator for all of our work in Burundi. Uh, and Alain and his group at uh, Essex and the group that he started, uh, Rene, uh, uh, leading the training that we've been doing in the DRC. Um, now, just a little more background. Uh, uh, Alain is, uh, uh, is a professor, uh, heads the chair for negotiation and mediation at the Essex Business School in Paris and Singapore. And uh, he was the one who created uh, the Institute for Research and Education on Negotiation in Europe, which is IRINE, and the group that we had contracted with to do our training in the, in, uh, in the DRC. Uh, he's uh, got an SJD uh, from Harvard, uh, the program for negotiation there, and he's led programs of research, training, and consulting on negotiating conflict resolution for government and business leaders all over the world. Uh, Liz is a managing partner now of another group called CM Partners, um, and uh, she is a Ph.D. candidate at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Um, she's currently managing a, a training program in Timor-Leste, uh, uh, and as I said, she uh, she managed and actually was residential in Burundi for, I guess, about two years, three, three years. Uh, but before that was also our, our, our lead facilitator in Burundi for now going on, what, five or six years? I got to think it through. Three of six years. Good <laughs> Lord. Um, she has designed and implemented training, negotiation, and joint problem-solving skills for rural women and youth in Rwanda as well, and served as and been our lead facilitator. I think you did some work with uh, with the uh, World Health Organization too, yes. as I recall. Um, but anyway, highly qualified individuals, and I'm now going to I think turn to uh, Alain first, oh, no, 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 Liz first. I thought okay, we had talked about this, believe it or not. See, it's going to be very informal. So Liz is going to start. Oh, yes. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming. And yes, we will leave a lot of time for questions. I noticed on the invitation list we have a number of people from a wide range of organizations and experience, some probably uh, who know a lot about the region and the conflicts, others who know more about training and uh, conflict management, conflict transformation. So direct your questions in whatever you know way you'd like and we'll do the best that we can. Uh, I did want to say one word about definitions which we were we are constantly struggling with ourselves and now that I'm back in a PhD program I realize that in some ways lots of progress has been made in other ways very little progress has been made so we'll we're in the the field of negotiation, conflict management. Is it conflict resolution, conflict transformation? Uh, what is the definition of mediation versus facilitation versus negotiation? And we see ourselves more as facilitators of a training process as opposed to mediators in the in the more classic sense. Although these days. People tend to also call what we do mediation, so uh, I think we're we're a bit wary of of stepping in all these different definitions and trying to uh, to come down really hard on one side or the other for the moment. Uh, again, we see ourselves; it's definitely third party intervention because we're not from the region and we're not part of the conflict, so we're intervening in that. Um, and so by our very presence are a third party intervener. And again, I would say we're much more facilitators of, of training, which we hope contributes to a transformation of the conflict. Um, however, if you do hear us say one word or the other, negotiation, mediation, and you have a question, you have experience that would 
tell you that what we do is not that, please again note it down and bring it up you know, during the question and answer because that's something we're struggling with uh, ourselves. So Anna, do you want to offer the frame now that I've <laughs> Yes, good morning. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, yes, we, uh, it's always complicated to, to say where to start when we try to explain what we have done there. Um, we prepare the paper and uh, we also have a lot of slides and I know you don't want to see slides. So I, I will only show you maybe two slides. Um, <laughs> Uh, so you see, I mean, there are many others. If you want, you, you can be <laughs> sure about this. Oh, yes, and we changed that one. Um, th we all know that it is important when you have a, a country uh, which has uh, known, um, which has been in a war situation, that it's very important that uh, um, political leaders of that country get together, uh, top leaders, and uh, that the international community, diplomats, help in the um, mediation process. And, and that's where you, we use the term mediation, right? There is a, a political mediation. When the, if an agreement has been signed, and it could be um, the Arusha Agreement in Burundi, it could be Sun City Agreement in Congo, uh, sometimes the people who have signed the agreement are not sure they were right to sign the agreement. They feel that there is a hand behind their back or, or forcing their hand for the signature of the agreement. So. The question is, how do you transform people who feel sometimes forced uh, into an agreement into people who, who really um, uh, integrate that, that it's suddenly this agreement is what they feel that they should do? Uh, part of what we have tried to do is to work at the second level, right? It's um, uh, saying that in, in many ways, these people who, who may have signed the agreement, they have a lot of people who work with them, uh, they are the principals, uh, they, are they have a lot of agents who work with them. Uh, it could be military, military leaders uh, with commanders in the field. It could be political leaders uh, who have also their own people. Um, and what we try to do is to, to really target, if I dare to use that word, um, target these N minus one leaders. Right? You, you have maybe uh, in, in a country, uh, 3, 4, 5, 10, 17 in Lebanon, uh, important communities, right? So the f what Howard and Steve have done very well, he, he talked about these meetings he had with 100 key leaders in Burundi and 76 in Congo. Is that what you said? Something like that, well, something <laughs> like that right? So that was, th that's these first meetings were to try to um, get their buy-in. Right? And that's uh, what uh, Steve talked about is the whole ownership aspect, right? Getting the, the, the ownership of uh, these national top leaders. Asking these top leaders to, um, uh, to put on a list the, influ the influential leaders for the future, for better or worse, right? So not as, as Steve mm -hmm. said, it's not simply getting the moderates in a part of the process, right? Getting the spoils, spoilers. If you get all of these lists from all of these key top leaders and you, you cross this list, you end up with, let's say, 100 key leaders who are influential or seen as influential by the top leaders in the, in the country. So these people could be, I mean, I, mean, I, I try to say what, what, are, what is the, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sh I shouldn't move then, right? Well, you, well, you can, can move, move now. Yeah, I, I prefer to move then. Uh, no, no, I feel like... Yeah, we're being webcast. Oh, I didn't know I was webcast, so I, I would have been more prepared if I had known voice. that. Sorry, guys. I'm losing my voice. No, they are. Oh, they are losing my voice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, we try to say, okay, how do we make sure that we have the representative leaders in the room? How, or how do we make sure that these leaders are as representative as possible? How do we make sure that we are inclusive in finding these, let's say, 100 leaders, right? We, sh we, sh we try to have, we had six criteria, right? Or that's the way Steve and Howard mm -hmm. build that, right? We need to have gender diversity. Um, and that means that even if it was sometimes hard to do that, but we had 30% of women, we say it's not 50%, but 30% of women, which is, is not always e so easy to find, but that's especially in the security sector, right? I mean, uh, we had one, one training in, in Kenya when we had only one woman, mm -hmm. so that we didn't meet that standard. Um, we also needed to have uh, professional diversity. So in the room, not simply uh, government people, but also uh, uh, maybe religious leaders, uh, security sector people, uh, professors, right? Having also 
Um, ethnic diversity, well, it's obvious what that means in Burundi. Um, but it's also had to be done in, in Congo to make sure we would have that. Uh, next criterion, uh, geographical diversity. There is always a danger to only get in a, in a room all the people from the capital of a country because they are available, they are just there. I think there was a lot of work that was done by Steve and Howard as conveners to make sure that there would be also people from the different regions and even people from, people from the diaspora because these are very important people to bring to uh, the table. I remember that we had one person who, who had not been in Burundi for 30 years, no. right? Mm -hmm. Since 1972, he was back in Burundi. He was also held by had bodyguards and everything, right? So geographical diversity, historical diversity. Wha what does that mean? That means that in the room, we should have people who represent all the time periods of a country. Take an example, take the example of, of Congo. You have had Lumumba time, you have had uh, Mobutu's time, and you have Kabila's time. So in the same room, you had people representing these three historical periods of the country. It's kind of even strange for them, because they would not even be there together ever, right? So th th that's why very often I say these are unlikely meetings. They are not supposed to be there together, right? Also making sure, uh, last criterion on, on designation of these key leaders, that we have a wide spectrum. Not simply the moderates, the peace lovers, right? Because they will always agree with each other. That's not so much what we're looking for, but getting also the hardliners in the room. I mean, the best way of, of making sure you have that, in, when you enter the room, it should be very cold. <laughs> I, I remember one meeting we had in Goma, when there was one person there sitting there. He was really alone there. Nobody wanted to sit next to him. I won't tell you what, it, what his job was, but uh, I know exactly why nobody wanted to sit next to, to him, right? So mm -hmm. having that was very important. Um, making sure, we already talked about that, there would be a local office structured around a personality who was seen as um, um, fair, neutral, honest by all the parties involved. Very difficult, by the way, to find that in Congo, mm -hmm. meaning finding a person who was recognized by all the parties as a fair head of an office, that was very difficult. So the person who was appointed was Michel Kassa, Michel Kassa, who was the former head coordinator of OCHA, the Office for Coordi uh, of Coordination of the UN for Humanitarian Aid. So when th I said, this is the most important part, right? It's really the convening part of the project. And I think that the, the, the word convener is very important in all of this work, right? One aspect that maybe uh, Steve didn't talk about but we spend a lot of time on that too, is that it's not simply convincing nat national top leaders, getting them to designate key leaders. It's also convincing, which was much easier for Howard, the donors to be involved in this, right? We have not talked about donors, but without donors, nothing of that kind would be possible, as you know all, no, right? So that was also very important. The ownership is also ownership of the international community of this project. So the process facilitation, if I, again, it's a matter, we are simplifying this, right? But if we had to simplify, what are the, the three steps? I think it is all about networking, relationship building. Steve said at the beginning in his introduction that one of the major problems is that there is no more any trust among these leaders. So how do you build trust? Um, how do you make sure that these people are not simply sitting around the table, but that they will talk to each other? So it is also building a, a convivial atmosphere where these people will feel part of one group, which is not to be uh, uh, taken for granted. These people don't even want to be sitting here. So there's a lot of the work that is done, and we could get into the details on how we do that. But it could be, for example, using first names. Um, so even if you are the vice president of the country, you will be, you will be called Azarias. Right? Even, yes, right. Yeah. Well, you may know who is that guy, right? So I, well, you know, okay. Even if you are the, um, the chief of staff of the army, you will be called by, the name, by your first name. So a lot of these barriers that are also given by the titles will drop immediately, right? We are all using first names. And in French, it's a little tricky to do that. And I, I don't even know how you translate that into English. <laughs> but you know that in French, you say either you say tu or you say vous. Mm -hmm. I, I, how do you call that in, in English? Do you formal or informal? Well, formal or informal. Well, I, it's a little, it's very difficult how you do that. Analogy. But I, we have come to a point when we 
purposefully tr uh, tr uh, switch from one to the other, uh, looking we are making a mistake, right? But it's not a mistake, it's deliberate, right? Tu uh, vois, as Arias, well, or, well it's, it's, it's tu, it's not vous, right? It's a, it's a little twist, but that will help in relationship building. These people are having lunches together. There is what I call the, um, the primus effect, or the Fanta <laughs> effect. <laughs> For those who of the region, you know that you will be drinking beers, primus, or you will be drinking Fanta, right? So this is part of the, the, of the system, right? It is deliberate. I remember the first time we had a, a, a training in, in Gozi, we realized that we had not thought that maybe people would like to be dancing at the end of the, 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 the training, when everything went very well after five days. Right? For the second Gozi, this was prepared. So there was no tables in the middle. Here, at least if you wanted to, to dance here, it would not be so easy. We don't have the space. But if we put all the chairs around, you would have the space and maybe we could do it, right? So all of that is about relationship building. It's really building trust it's, uh, so that there will be some networking effect. Something also that is a little different in what we have done here compared to what we have done for WHO, for example, is that there was, it's not simply about a one-shot workshop that we're doing because I'm very more and more reluctant about that. I don't see if it's really even useful to do that. We do that a lot because we don't have sometimes the financial means to go from a project system to a program system, right? But we know that there should be follow-up on what is done there. Therefore, the importance of this local office that who will be following up on possible commitments and we will also have follow-up workshops where these people will convene again. Right? All of that is very important. It's about the, the, the whole issue of trust. Second part is, yes, during the, um, these days when we are together, there's a lot of work on methods. We are process facilitators, and uh, part of what we think is that the participants must be provided with the techniques for them to be able to find answers to their own problems. So all work is to make sure that they are better equipped in terms of methods. We are not giving them the answers to their problems. They know what their problems are, and they know better how to find the answers to their problems. But they don't necessarily know how to get there. So there's a lot of work done on how to make the right decision. How to get to a point when you, how do you prepare a decision? How do you, how do you make it more, how do you make your communication more effective? That's a lot of work on listening, active listening. I mean, Liz and I, we have been so, we have had so much fun doing um, this together. I mean, little scenes, or doing it with the participants, so that they see what listening is about. Because listening is not l listening to your wife that you love. That's oh, well, well, it's not easy always with my wife, so I don't know about but Anyway, but it's not, that's not the tough part. Is am I able to listen to someone who is attacking me? Am I able to reframe, rephrase what I hear the other person say? This whole active listening part. But it's a lot of work on that. It's not, by the way, only the methods about um, communication, mediation, it's all of that. It's not simply s about psychological interactions, and I insist on that. Part of um, our training with Roger Fisher and uh, the Harvard Program of Negotiation has sometimes been focused too much on psychological issues. And that's where I, I, I must say that a great part of this workshop has been brought by what Howard has done with a game that is called SimSoc. Maybe some of you have heard of that. It's been developed by a guy called William Gamson. It is also to show sociological interactions. We, we put people in different region, for example, it's a simulated society where they will experience what it is to be, for example, in a poor region. So put, for example, a vice president in the poor region in that game and put some of the progressive people in the rich region and see how they react. What you will see is that the people who are rich have a lot of work to manage their wealth. So they don't spend a lot of time about what is happening with the poor. And the poor, even the guy who is uh, the, the in embodying the law and order per, uh, person, right, will be doing riots, right? So, so you see, this kind of game we do on the third day in general is really to bring people to the awareness that it is not simply about psychological interactions. It's also about sociological conditions, right? That if you are in a situation when you don't have means to survive, you don't have food, you don't have what you need, to survive, you may become violent. So we also try, it's the whole conflict transformation, realizing that we need to be very careful about the environment and, and, and not creating 
uh, unfair distribution of resources that will increase the risks of violent conflicts. So all of that is done uh, during the first three days. But so you see, we are not even talking about Burundi. We are talking about everywhere in the world when there are inequalities, when there are possible tensions. So the last part of the workshop is for us to try to, now they are ready for the third part. Because right? you see what many of these participants have said who have been part of, of uh, formal diplomatic exchanges is that they said that they are not ready to talk to each other. They don't even want to do it. So the only, uh, what we're trying to do is to make sure they, they are, after this first part, relationship building and, and methods on how to work with each other, that now they can even listen to each other and they can get to the issues themselves. Last two days of a workshop. Right? They will be, they will identify what are the key issues they want to work on. Well, there, there are a few methods on how we get there, right? They will try to do, uh, to build a diagnostic of the situation, right? And then they will start thinking about solutions. And a difference also in this type of workshop with respect to other workshops that I've, that I've seen or have been part of, is that it will not end with recommendations. How many workshops have you attended with recommendations? You know what recommendations is about is, I tell you what you should do. Right? That's recommendation, right? Because of course, it's ne not my problem, it's your problem. That's not the right thing to do. These people are influential leaders. They can do something about the situation, even if it's a little something, right? So it's about trying to get them to make Commitments, whatever they are, we're not pushing them to make any commitment. But together, they, they may identify how they could make things better, right? Mm -hmm. So, and Liz? can I just Sorry. tell? Oh, yes, George, no, no, that's all right. Uh, just a good example of this, um, and we'll go back through just briefly the history, sort of more statistical, how many people have been trained in Burundi and Congo. But in 2007, we had a workshop with the, the current government in Burundi that included everyone except the president. So we're talking about ministers, heads of all the opposition political parties, the army chief of staff, head of the police, uh, et cetera. Interior. The four former presidents of the country, um, minister of the interior. And at one point during the workshop, and this was sort of towards the end of day two, and there has, to put you in context, there had been an 11 or 12 month blockage in parliament, literally no legislation proposed or passed um, during this time period. And this was one of the reasons we'd been asked to organize the workshop was to see if we could possibly generate some movement uh, between the opposition parties and, and the, the ruling party and bringing in some of the major actors. The reason that the security sector was there is because there, there are five generals from the former uh, rebel army, the CNDD, FTD, that control very key posts in government and were felt to be sort of powers behind the throne as well. So you sort of have to think about who's there around the table or in the room, if you will. Um, and at one point, one of the participants said, well, these are all really good ideas, but I just don't think the right people are here. And this is a point at which, as a facilitator, you sort of have to do, you're in the room with some very prestigious persons, the former presidents of the country, and you have to say to yourself, well, do I call them out on this, or do, do I cause a diplomatic incident and sort of point fingers, or how do I handle this? Because on the one hand, we have tried to create, in this workshop too, first names, although the participants themselves did not always buy into that. Sometimes they'll point across the table and say, mon général, or, you know, monsieur le président, you know, when they're no longer president, but it's hard to get them to sort of say after many years, you know, Pierre for Pierre Bouyoya. It's just not very easy to do that to the former president who's had two coup d'etats and that kind of thing. It just doesn't come naturally. Um, so what do you do? What do you, as a facilitator, on the one hand, you have an obligation if you're thinking about training as intervention and <laughs> leading to conflict transformation. On the other hand, you don't really want to cause a problem for the American ambassador as this is an American program. And there's all those other sort of politics in your head. And I thought, but that, that's actually not acceptable. So I said, as I was the person who happened to be facilitating at that moment, without you know, Howard's behind me, and I'm sure thinking that I'm going to create some, some problem, but I said, well, if I look around the room and you tell me that the right people aren't here, 
uh, one, I would suggest that you tell us who the right people are and we think about getting them here. We're here for five days together. We're, you can travel pretty much anywhere in Burundi in about half a day, so it's uh, not, not difficult to bring those people in. But I said if, if you're referring to the president of the country, who was literally the only person who wasn't in the room at the time amongst this almost 40, group of 40 people, I said I think it's a bit disingenuous to say to yourselves as leaders of political parties as who have constituents who follow your lead uh, that you're not the right people. And if you're not, perhaps we need to think differently about how we organize our work here. And there was a little bit of a pause and indeed a change. People said, absolutely, you're right. We are the right people. I got support from the participants. I didn't need to sort of, I just needed to say it once and then the participants themselves said, no, in fact, that's not legitimate. That's too often what we do do, which is, develop recommendations at the end of the program and ask someone else to do the work for us when in fact we are the ones who are responsible for, for the work to be done. So it's an ongoing process. This has happened in 2007 and we've been working with many of these folks since the beginning of 2003. So it's not an easy conflict transformation just doesn't happen. It's an evolution and, and the context changes and you have to be prepared, I think, uh, when you move from project to program to invest the resources that it takes to make sure that you can continue to, to have this transformation process happen. And I, I think that's what Alain's going to get to now in terms of impact, but um, what are you trying to transform? Well, it's people's attitude. It's how they think about things. Yes, you want the results to be different, but we only get different results if we actually reflect on what assumptions bring us to the table and what we think is possible and then how those assumptions get translated into our thinking process on a daily basis, how we make decisions <laughs> and how we motivate others to, to join us in the work that we're trying to do. So just that quick example. Thanks, Liz. Um, something I, I, I may want to, to add here is before going to the impact stuff is how do we get from the 100 initial leaders yeah. at the end to 8,000 people who were part of this process. Um, I, as you remember, so with Howard and Steve, we got the top leaders to somehow designate 100 key leaders. But as part of the commitment process, it is important that we let the participants in many ways drive the process itself. So it is in these first meetings in uh, 2003 that people say, well, it's great that you have these national leaders here, but the real problem is the security forces. The real problem is that you have these commanders from the rebel groups and the regular army that are not meeting. So you should get, and that was more like a recommendation for us, but that was, you should get these people also together in the room. And it's not simply, and that was the meeting in, in uh, the first meeting in Kenya. Right, in Nairobi. But then they said, well, uh, what about the, the commission um, for the integrated command of the army? Because these people have been working together during the last three months. They have not achieved anything. They are meeting and they don't achieve anything. They have three major issues they need to, to, to work on. How do they define what is a combatant, a fighter? Right? How do they harmonize ranking? And how do they allocate the post in the integrated army afterwards? They can't get that done. So, well, why don't you get these people also a part of this process? And just, right, it's uh, maybe a chance for us, but after one week when they've been working in, in this workshop, they could achieve a lot more results in, in, in dealing with these issues. The same afterwards when it's about the, the electoral process. There's a, a high risk that elections will uh, go, uh, will mean back to violence, right? There is a risk of going back to violence in the electoral process. So why don't we apply the same rules for these campaign chiefs, right, that they get together, work together to build the electoral code? Of course, there is a lot of expertise that can be brought to the table to explain how others have done it. But at the end, it doesn't matter how they've done it in Chad, it's how they must do it in Burundi that matters to them, right? I will always remember that discussion I had with a Belgian uh, attaché, military at attaché, and I'm more comfortable saying that because I'm Belgian, right? So it's not that I want to criticize the Belgians, I'm Belgian myself, right? Major problem to be Belgian in that region, so I prefer <laughs> to say I'm coming from Paris, <laughs> right? But then, let's, let's go back to the example, right? 
The guy said, well, we have done a great assessment of the, the situation of the Burundian army, and we have the great format, the maquette for the army, for the Burundian army. I said, Colonel, how do you think the Burundians will react to this wonderful plan that you have put together? Well, I'm, I'm sure they will appreciate the work we have put into this. Okay, well, I knew that it would not be the case. How do you expect anyone in Burundi hearing the former colonial power telling them how to run the army? Do you, even if it's the right way of doing, that's not the way they feel about it, right? So all of that is, it's much better if they drive the process and get to their own uh, code of electoral conduct, etc. that they build that themselves. They have done it themselves. So the ownership part that we're talking about for the beginning, as the, in part of the convening aspect, is as important in the facilitation part. So that, that's, by the way, where, yes, we are not mediators, but that's somehow close to mediation. Right, because we are third party, our intervention is to help them get to uh, the right uh, decisions for them, and right, that they elaborate that themselves. Um, one example uh, in, of what happened in August 2006, that maybe, uh, do, how much time do we have, uh, Steve? A little more. One, so one more minute, okay. No, no, we, we, we'll leave an hour for questions. So. Well, if you, if you have done, right, all of the things in the middle and on the left, right, um, in, in some ways, uh, and maybe we could talk about the impact because it will help uh, understand better this example I want to give about f uh, August 2006 in, in Kinshasa. Um, I think that part of the workshop will probably transform the people in the room, or at least that's some of our hopes, and it's some of our observations. Um, most of the people come to this workshop with the idea that this workshop will change the others who really need changes. <laughs> it's always about the others, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I've, you know, I have several kids. It's always about the other one, you know. My daughter is always blaming my son, and the opposite is also true. So it's always about the other. Accusing the other is, accuses bias is so much part of who we are as people, right? Um, but so what is happening, I believe, and that's the first level of impact, is that they realize that they have a share in the issue of responsibility, that they may have contributed to the problem as it is, and their behaviors may continue to contribute to the problem. So re already realizing that they have to be, to act, to see things differently, to communicate differently, and to act differently is already some kind of impact. That is happening in general during these five days. And okay, you say, well, that's great. So it has happened, right? Conversion, right? Transformation, no. M my wife always says, uh, the will to change is not change. Well, she's probably talking about me, by the way, but, uh, <laughs> and I think she's right. It's not enough to want to change, it's how you change, right? So the question is that there is impact, yes, awareness impact. Is, does that change the way they behave? Well, that's the second level of impact that we are looking for. And the only way that could happen is that we, the, the program should be thought as a long-term program. You can't just do one workshop, it is if you want reinforcement issues. So bringing them back, following up on what they say is very important, right? Uh, so it's try to reach the sustainability in, in transformation. Another thing that we hope to achieve is that suddenly, th this, it's not simply that I may change, that I may change really in the, in the long run, but it is also that suddenly you, I will change with the other, and in particular with the people in the room. Um, there is a creation of a network among the people in the room that can make a difference. Example, as part of the, um, uh, some of the participants were, for example, uh, heads of the National Assembly in Congo. And there was a major problem at some point of the change of the head of the National Assembly. Well, the good news is that the, the guy who had to replace the former guy was also part of the workshop. So they could somehow ensure some soft landing because there was already some more connection between them. And it also happened for the third one. So you see what I'm saying is that if we started building some connection with each other here, it will help us when we really have an issue to deal with, right? Um, I will always remember uh, this afternoon in, in August 2006 when Azarias and another vice president were sitting in a garden at, the mo at that moment, President Kabila and P Vice President Bemba, who were the winners of the first round of the presidential elections, 
were in a situation where we, we, we didn't know if the whole city of Kinshasa would explode or not, right? And uh, the residents of the vice president had been bombed, not very well, by the way, because it was not killed, not at the right time either, because there were 15 diplomats and the residents of president, vice president Bemba at the time. But anyway, a lot of tensions. When I, I had this, I remember this, uh, this um, a discussion with uh, two vice presidents who were trying more or less to mediate in that situation. I asked them a stupid question. How is that possible that people who have been working together as president, vice president for so many years after the Sun City Agreement, that one is trying to kill the other and the other is ready to do the same to the other? How is that possible? Have they never had any dinner together? Is, have they no inform? No, not once, not once, they said. They had this kind of socializing. Well, then I'm not surprised. They had cabinet meetings, but they had no way of building a relationship with each other. So getting to this network relationship aspect and making it work between these uh, key leaders is very important, very, very important. Maybe if that had been the case between Bemba and Kabila, maybe we, we would not have had that. Another issue is that we hope that these people will also impact their own people and their own team members. We also hope that they will impact <coughs> their bosses trying to influence them to, to organize maybe this cabinet meeting. Right? It, it took some, of course, it, it took Howard, who had a relationship with President Nkurunziza, to, to get this government retreat in uh, 2005. The, the first one in 2005. Five, right? Yeah. Um, but, um, but I mean is that also all the people who had been involved in the early meetings felt that it was necessary not to do it simply between the key leaders, but to do it between the, uh, with the top leaders which something w that has been missing, by the way, in Congo, I feel. Right? It was done in Burundi, not done in Congo, so you don't have the same cohesion, uh, even of the, the, the ministers, that could explain some of the aspects. Then the question is, okay, great, you train 100 people, 500 people, but there are millions of people in the country, or there are even uh, thousands of people in an institution. How do you get an institution to change? Right? That's another level of impact that is more complicated. Well, I mean, at least you can talk about that maybe, but um, yeah, so maybe not baby, then let's do it, but <laughs> let's do it. Please. All right. Uh, well, returning a bit to the, the four imperatives that Steve mentioned earlier, one of the things he talked about was getting people to agree on the rules of the game, which is not sort of self-evident. We have a sense uh, of how, in our own country, how Congress works and people sort of understand how you're supposed to behave and what the processes are to achieve the goals that you want. And one of the things that we try to accomplish, I think, in the in the trainings is to get people to at least agree, agree on the rules of the how the process will happen, all right? We can't tell them what the rules will be within the particular institutions. That's up to them. That's the substantive aspect. But we can share ideas on how we think different processes could be developed to help them better reach their goals. And I think when Alain talks about going from, OK, we have 100 mixed leaders, and then where do you go next? The, the whole idea of the buy-in is that the participants themselves tell you tell us where we're supposed to go. And so the security sector, for example, was one of the number one institutions that was indicated needed to be changed in Burundi, also in Congo. The, the, the challenges, though, which I hope folks will address later, um, in Burundi, we've trained one in a thousand Burundians, which is, even as I say that, it's pretty incredible. In Congo, though, we haven't even trained one in a hundred thousand. So if you want transformation, uh, already you have an issue of scale. Um, Burundi has some unique aspects simply because of its size. Um, uh, so when you talk about reforming the security sector institutions and trying to introduce this, it, it, you're actually not talking about something that's impossible. That's actually something you can get your head around. So the way we decided to do that, there are two examples, um, one at the community level, which we can talk about later if you're interested, where the vast majority of people of those 8,000 that we've trained were, were located. Um, the other in the security sector institution were training of trainers programs. So in the end, it isn't Liz and Alain who are out there training people, frankly. That's not a sustainable model, and it is, actually isn't very effective in the end because you're asking 
people to understand frameworks and ways of thinking. I, I can't necessarily relate to, to everyone. I don't know how people are reasoning and thinking and how they value uh, certain aspects of their lives and their futures. I need to work with others who can do that much better than I can. So we designed a training of trainers program that really was intended to reach uh, Burundians who then adapted the materials very, very well for different audiences. So whether you're talking about uh, the security sector where you needed to bring in examples that were much more relevant to the day-to-day -day lives of officers or you're talking about at the community level where you needed to bring in examples uh, that didn't involve, you know, for literate or, or excuse me, uh, semi-literate or illiterate populations, very different ways of going about uh, the work. So in the, the security sector, in terms of having institutional change, as Anna spoke about, our objective was more to look at changing, we didn't want to change, I shouldn't say it that way, to help people talk about what were the norms and the values that they wanted the new army, for example, to exhibit. And that became part of their own um, doctrine if you will, in the army. And then our role was to help them create processes to make that happen. So that was part of changing people's attitudes about what it meant to command, what it means to lead in an army that is a Republican army as opposed to an army that belongs to one side or the other or that's dominated by one ethnic group or the other. And I think that's where the training of trainers was most useful and where institutional change is probably the most evident in our work in Burundi is having trained over 200 officers and then having trained as trainers 45 officers who then work in the, the military academy with um, officers of different rank and then who will go out and work with soldiers, uh, you have a very different approach. And that, I think, is where our most successful institutional change has happened, is you can't do it with Liz and Alain out there. It's not even appropriate for Liz and Alain to be, to be working on that level. We don't necessarily understand the challenges. Uh, we don't understand, it's not just the language, it's how people conceptualize what their problems are uh, and how they articulate them and what, how they seek their solutions. Um, so that, that, I think, is a very critical piece of what's made it possible to have some sustainable impact in Burundi. So the adaptation of the materials, but more particularly the, the, the training of trainers process, which can result in real institutional change. Uh, I think we're going to stop the presentation here now uh, and turn to questions. Uh, I think that's really laid a good groundwork. We have as you can see, could go on for a very long time up here. And so we've got to go against our, our worst instincts to keep on talking and, and let you get into the dialogue. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I won't, I won't uh, summarize what's been said in any way. I, I think it's a very good scene setter for us, uh, except just to pick up on one thing that Alain said, uh, which is about the, the, the differences of the kind of process work that we're talking about and, and what is often done in the field. And that is, uh, and, and Howard and I ran into this throughout our early process of trying to bring uh, the, these projects together, both in the Congo and uh, in, in Burundi and in Liberia as well, with, with uh, diplomats, donors, and others saying to us, uh, uh, but these people already know each other. They are meeting in the cabinet room. Uh, they have beers together after work. Uh, you know, they know each other. What are you really talking about? Well, that's the point Alan was making, which is so essential here. They don't really know each other. And they don't even know sometimes that they don't really know each other. When you see how they react to each other when they're doing the simulated society, when they're beginning to find out, when they have their very first introductions exercise, and, and, and they learn about their families and where they come from, and, 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 and they'll hear a... a, a, a Tutsi uh, colonel in the army who is purported to have done very bad things, talking about his Hutu brothers who were raised by, by his family after the violence, by his father after the violence. When they hear these kinds of things about each other, uh, it, it is no longer the kind of dialogue, uh, uh, brief uh, uh, interaction that happens on a professional basis it is really beginning to understand each other. And, and there really is a transformation. And I think this personal transformation in terms of the impacts that Alan was talking about is where it really starts and begins to build towards any kind of institutional transformation. 
But let us stop there. Let you get into the uh, the act. Uh, we do want to say so. So I don't forget it at the end when we're bringing this to a close. That Alain has written a very comprehensive paper, which we are going to make available to all of you electronically afterwards. We thought of making copies of it and putting it out here, but we decided it would be easier just to send it to you all. We have all of your email addresses, so you will be receiving that. We will have uh, this information and a lot, lot more in it. Uh, now, the way we normally do our questions and answers, we will follow here. Uh, we are being uh, uh, video streamed, as we said, so we want you to raise your hand, be recognized, and then we'll bring you a microphone so you can speak on the microphone. Uh, uh, pose your questions. We normally say don't make comments, keep it to questions, but I think for this dialogue you can make comments as well. And if you could introduce yourselves, Absolutely please. Absolutely introduce yourselves. Insisted upon. Okay, I see two in the middle right here to begin with. And we'll take a couple of comments, questions in a row before we uh, ask panel inter intervention. Thank you very much. I'm Joe Clark. I'm a Canadian, uh, and I'm privileged to serve on the advisory committee to the Africa program here. Uh, I want to ask about, I guess, durability and applicability, and I'm going to ask three questions. One, you made uh, reference to diasporas in your original sample of people. I would assume that part of what you need are people who have a continuing commitment to the actual community. Uh, diaspora representatives do not always do that, and I wonder if that is a problem. I wonder if there's a limit upon the diaspora participation you uh, uh, you have and, and what you do about that. Secondly, and I'm sorry to ask a success question, but mm -hmm. over you talked about sustainable impacts and sustainable success. How long a time frame uh, does it take? How far out from the beginning of the program do you have to be to be able to judge whether there has been um, sustainable success. And the third question is, is this a small state program? Does it work anywhere near as well in a huge complex DRC as it does in a Burundi? Thanks. Okay, th those are three questions. We'll take one more. <laughs> and yes, right here was the next hand. Hello, Janet Anderson. I'm an independent consultant, worked in Burundi off and on over the last 10 years with the media. And the question is, is it um, useful or difficult, the media? I've always found it very interesting to work there because it's such a vibrant place. There are so many different uh, radio stations, mm -hmm. so much going on in comparison where I've also worked in neighboring Rwanda. And I've always regarded it as a useful aspect to this kind of transformation. Is it or, or are they a pain? Okay, uh, we will let everybody chip in here. Let me just pick up on, on, on Joe's uh, dias diaspora question. Um, uh, in the planning of uh, and, uh, and, and the preparation uh, for this project, uh, we of course had lots of people in the broader diaspora uh, who we sought advice from and et cetera, but in terms of who we brought to the table, who we were selecting, the only reaching out to the diaspora was though were, were to individuals who were uh, who who were there because they had no other choice. The war was still underway. There was no ceasefire uh, at the time we began this project in 2002 and 2003, and we needed their representation. Uh, so we actually did visit with people in Europe, and and uh, 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 Alain is referring to a specific person in his comment earlier, who who we all know. Uh, who is is an interesting friend of ours now, and we and we watched the process when when he first came back as a representative of one of the armed rebel factions, uh, and he had to move into the community and move around with armed guard and et cetera. Uh, it was an emotional re uh, uh, re reuniting with his family and these sorts of things. But he but he wasn't there as because we were reaching out to the diaspora. It was because of his representing this group that had to be brought in. Uh, his his own uh, uh, transformation and his and his own experience coming back after 30 years was remarkable, and we all witnessed that with some emotion. Um, uh, let me turn the other questions over to the other panelists. Start where you will. Just one more comment on the the diaspora. I think it is important to reach out, particularly at the beginning of any process like this, because so many people do find themselves in the diaspora now. In particularly in Burundi, many people have returned, so it, it's mm -hmm. changed a bit the nature of the program. And I would say the vast majority of our participants live and work in Burundi, so the commitment is very much found there. And in Burundi, because the program then transformed itself into a local NGO, there I think 
we also have a, a more that leads to the next uh, question about sustainability. I think. I'm sorry. Let, let me throw one other thing in there, though, because it's really a ticklish question. When we were looking at the DRC and the and the DRC diaspora in in Europe, in particular, was was a very negative one, mm -hmm. very very political, very divisive, uh, and and one we did not reach out to, for that reason. Uh, uh, and, and obviously we have some of that mirrored here in the United States as well. Uh, in each of these countries, Liberia for instance, a huge diaspora, uh, uh, who, all of whom have political motivations, all of whom. So, so I think the second half of your question on, on continuing uh, commitment is, is the important part. <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. lost my train of thought there. So <laughs> anyway, um, uh, just quickly, I was going to say uh, on success, uh, I don't think we're out far enough yet. I think we're very pleased and um, very optimistic in Burundi, um, sort of despite the current climate. Uh, I think that more and more people with whom you speak, and particularly out in rural areas, it's as peace beca becomes more of the norm, it does make it more difficult to contemplate going back to war. That doesn't mean that Burundi is stable. It doesn't mean that it, there are not risks. I do think, though, that people feel much more strongly today than they might have even two years ago that peace is the direction they'd like to continue to move in. Um, and frankly, as uh, I work with two colleagues um, who are both up at the, the Fletcher School at Tufts University, and they did a very interesting research project on Burundi, youth in Burundi and youth in Rwanda. And the youth in Burundi are more positive. And I think that's related very much to sort of the overarching political climate and getting to the media question. It's because people do feel they're able to express themselves more freely in Burundi, even though they would readily acknowledge that Security is probably better in Rwanda. There's certainly, the infrastructure is better, and there's been more investment on that level. It's an interesting uh, psychological difference, though, in terms of how people, and particularly young people, feel about their futures. Um, that, that being able to express themselves and imagine and dream and articulate that uh, actually goes a long way towards creating some stability I in a country. Um, and, and we have worked with the media. The media have been integrated into all of our programming. Uh, so it's, and I've seen over the, the, well, the 10 plus years that I've been working in Burundi and the six plus years on this, this, in this particular program that there's been a significant improvement in how the media conducts itself and what its role is in, in disseminating information, um, in educating people. Um, average Burundians about what's happening, as m most of you know, most people get their information by the radio, so it's, it's a very, um, it's an important tool that, that needs to be managed uh, wisely, and I think they actually in Burundi have played quite a positive role. I actually don't know as much about Congo, so I can't comment on the, uh, we've ha certainly had many members of the media present at the workshops in Congo, but I, I don't know as much about the media generally there. Um, but yes, on success, I think we still have to Cautiously optimistic for Burundi, but we still have a, a little ways to go before we can unequivocally say anything about that. On the time frame, if I remember, it's in '97 that Howard thought of putting the program together. Mm -hmm. it's, the funding came in 2002. The mm -hmm. program started in 2003. Uh, right. So patience is very <laughs> important at the beginning to get ownership, to get the sponsorship. Uh, and then I think that to, to make it sustainable, uh, yes, I mean, it, it m must be long-term programs, which is not easy to get, right? It, in general, it's two-year commitment from donors. Donor patients for. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I feel it's always starting later than we hope, uh, with less funds than we hoped. So sustainability is, is an issue. It's not so easy to get there. I, I think that what makes it easier, maybe also in Burundi, is that there is a, a, a Burundian who has really been there mm -hmm. to nationalize the whole project, right? Mm -hmm. Fabien is seen now, it's really a, a, a Burundian yeah. NGO, yeah. right? With support of outside, but it's really now running by itself. And that should be the goal. Yes. I mean, it, it, the it's sustainability is that suddenly you have one institution in the country that is seen as a fair uh, institution bringing people together. Yes, I think there is a difference between small state programs, Burundi and uh, Congo. 
I mean, I remember that was the question, by the way, that Peter Oven asked with the first uh, major um, audit of the program. Evaluation. How is it, yes, evaluation, how could it be uh, duplicability and scalability? I, I think that it is not so easy to, uh, to take a program that works very well there because Howard had the very good connections in Burundi, also in Congo, but Congo is more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, the way, by the way, uh, if I dare to say that, but the way um, some of the actions of the administra um, American administration in Burundi have been, may have been perceived differently in Congo, mm -hmm. uh, am I vague enough to be clear? <laughs> <laughs> Right, so, uh, okay, so uh, right, I, mean, I think that the, uh, in Burundi, the uh, American administration has been seen as a totally neutral broker. Uh, but the situation of Congo is very complicated, difficult. Uh, there is also an economy of war and a lot of minerals. So it's more complicated, much more complicated. Not simply the question of scale, but the question of natural resources. I think there are, well, it's also, um, you also have the power of the f the some other. It's not simply uh, the, inter the international community. It's other countries around that may have interest in Congo mm -hmm. and having an interest to keep their interest in Congo. So all of that makes it much more complex to be successful in in uh, in Congo. The media, uh, Janet's question. I think that and it's a good it's good that you asked this question because I, I didn't have a chance to talk about social impact. Right? You, though everything we're talking is about social impact. I think the only way we get to social impact of these kind of programs is that you, you try to involve the media carefully in the process. Um, and I say it's both about training journalists also, making them understand that they have also a role in the process to approach these issues differently and that uh, what they could either ignite m more violence <laughs> by using freedom of the press, or on the contrary, they can really uh, have a very positive um, effect. And I'll go back to my example of August 2006. We had a workshop at that time in Kinshasa, and that's at the time when the, the events uh, happened. And we had in the room representatives of the different uh, groups from the east and from the west in, uh, of Congo, and they decided that they had to go public and make some uh, statement that it was a very important time and that it was not the moment to make all the efforts collapse. So I remember, very it's a pity we didn't film what happened there. W though we may even have a video of what happened. Yeah, I don't know if we have that yeah. somewhere, but anyway. Um, they decided to write a call for peace in the four languages of the country and journalists and the press, television, uh, um, radio, came in the residence. We were all blocked there anyway because it was a kind of state of siege, right? Um, and we, the press came and then this call for peace in the four languages of the country was diffused during three days at, the, um, at, at, at this moment. We don't know if it had any social impact, how can we know? Uh, but at least that was maybe the, uh, the right thing to do at that time. <laughs> But it was only possible because of everything that had been done during the first six months, that suddenly these people felt that, that they could have a dialogue together and that they could work, all of them, for social or national cohesion in their own country, right? So, yes, it is very important to see how the press could be leveraged in, in, the, in that situation. Uh, let me make three quick interventions on those questions. Uh, on the small state, large state uh, issue, obviously there's different points of entry, different people to table, et cetera, uh, scope as you're looking at the larger state. Uh, but it's destructive. Howard and I went, were invited into DRC uh, in uh, February of 2005 based on the success we'd been having in Burundi. Uh, we're invited by the British government, by DFID, uh, to, uh, to meet with that plethora of uh, uh, political leaders, Congolese, uh, donors, uh, the SEAT group, and et cetera. Uh, coming away from there with everyone saying what you've done in Burundi is really very good, it probably will work here, we should give it a try. So our original concept was to design a national program of leadership, very much based on what we had done in Burundi. Didn't work out that way. Uh, uh, we, we ended up focusing both on events, institutions, and crisis intervention as the violence re erupted in the East, uh, uh, looking at trying to strengthen the National Assembly after the elections, working towards the elections in the beginning. So we've never, ever 
mirrored exactly what we did in Burundi and the Congo. It's been very, very much focused on specific incidents, specific target groups. Uh, uh, we, we did a little bit of that in Burundi, of course, with the turning to the security sector, as Liz and Alan have explained. On, on uh, the media, just very quickly, it, it's interesting. We, ha we thought in the beginning, although we included media representatives in our training in Burundi, w we would make the training not open to the media. We wanted this to be done in private uh, uh, so, so that they would be comfortable with each other and with the kind of transformation we hoped would happen. It wasn't really until the training before the elections in 2005 with the political parties, Alan was describing where they were working on their own code of conduct, they were working on their re relationships together as they went into the elections, where they wanted to bring in the media to see what they were doing. Uh, they wanted to use the media to make uh, joint uh, uh, statements uh, against violence and intimidation during the elections, and et cetera. It was they who wanted to bring in the media then, which was, was very remarkable. Um, and then finally, on how to judge sustainable success, uh, uh, Liz is, uh, is quite right. We really don't know yet. But uh, one thing we have definitely learned, as everybody in this room who, who manages the grant knows, is we didn't have good monitoring and evaluation systems when we began this, uh, which we've, we've honed pretty well now. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons along the way in, in, in terms of outside evaluations. Uh, uh, Alain referred to one that was done by Peter Yuvin in our midterm in Burundi, uh, and using our own evaluators and our own evaluation systems, both of individual workshops as well as the long term. So we, we work really hard on trying to catalog uh, uh, what impacts we have and, and how to do that. But when you're dealing with human transformation, that is very difficult. <laughs> Next questions, we've got, I know one was over here and one back here to John. So let's start here and here and there next and there next. <laughs> uh, John Harbison, City University of New York and now Johns Hopkins ICE. Um, I wanna pick up on Mr. Clark's question about the small stakes. I think it goes a lot further than than um, been talked about so far. <coughs> I've been a big fan of this process from, from a distance. I'm an academic political scientist, I'm an Africanist, and I'm interested in democracy issues and weak state problems and so forth. And what I, what a reason why I'm, I've been such a fan of it is, I think potentially it goes some really fundamental places in terms of how we think about democracy and how we think about the state, particularly in African countries. But I don't know that. And so what I, I, I'm looking for, all three of you to say, <coughs> and Howard also that I've been in some conversation with about this, is how and to what extent this process gets into the guts of what the state is and how it's conceptualized and how it's reconstructed. Okay, there's the, this, the one little place. I mean, if you look at thinking about the state, Charles Tilly, for example, right? Charles Tilly says about Europe states that, in bottom line, states they're about war and war preparation. Great, okay, that's a lot of help. And if you're an, if you're an Africanist, right? <laughs> and so my hunch has been all along that the, he's fundamentally wrong about that, at least in African context, and that it involves a lot more about consent. And so what I'm interested in is where and to what extent what you're doing gets into those the guts of the problem. Let's do have one more question here from John. I see everybody's really anxious to uh, jump yes. in on this, so we don't want to lose this train of thought. We'll have to. Okay. Uh, I'm John Barks from Search for Common Ground, and we've been working in Burundi for 14 years, and we've worked very closely with you over the years, actually in the proposal writing stage, going back even before the project started. But listening to you today, I'm struck by the extraordinary overlap in the kinds of work that we've been doing and you've been doing and a frustration, because you know, we've, we've started Studio Ijambo, the, the, mm -hmm. the radio production studio, which I think has had a lot to do with having that vibrant media there. It's mm -hmm. been there the longest, it's influenced all the others. And we do soap opera, for example, for there, which reached 90% of the people. And we do call-in shows that reach a huge number of the people. And it seems to me there could be a, a much more symmetry than there is mm -hmm. in terms of the themes that you're developing going into the soap operas, putting them into the talk shows, mm -hmm. and working on them together. Because to take what you're doing and essentially to hold a magnifying glass up to it, so that 
hundreds of thousands or millions of people are getting the ideas mm -hmm. and the like. And I don't think we've gone that far in our cooperation, and I think it really would be a great idea for us to do that. Okay, let's... Watch it. Last question was actually much more detail-oriented about the methodology, so maybe, maybe you do want to go ahead and... Okay. 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 Let, let, let's feel these while, while, while the thoughts are fresh in our minds. Uh, I yeah. I, I, I think what you said is so important. I, I, I believe that um, we go in so many countries with uh, or, uh, projecting our own, own understanding of democracy, um, which is, well, it's about debate, it's about um, um, uh, you are from the, the majority, I'm from the opposition, and we will fight together, um, and the press will be amplifying maybe our discussions. If we import all of that, right, including sometimes the, 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 the um, opposition between uh, bosses and trade unions, if we import all of that in a society that is already divided, fragmented, I'm not quite sure that it will not make things worse. And I'm, I'm really serious about that. I, I'm not sure that saying, well, they need to have this fight for the elections to become president. Maybe they should have, before they have the fight, they should have some building blocks uh, and some common ground, right? The, and, and, uh, and democracy is also that. It's building this common platform, uh, rules about the game. And um, I think that this is, I mean, we have so much, emphasized too much the confronta confrontational part of democracy, and not, we have not seen that we can do these confrontations because we have a common uh, platform. In a country without common platform, if you, you go for confrontation before it's done, I, I think it, it's really, really dangerous. So uh, a lot of work has to be done with this second way of looking at democracy, I believe. Just quickly, uh, uh, yes, I concur. We don't haven't gone far enough, I think. Um, frankly, one of the reasons that it's been a pleasure to go back to school, and because having to do coursework is to actually make the scholar practitioner link even stronger. Because I think there is something much, much that can be learned um, in academia, and we don't bring enough of that into our work as practitioners. And that's something that. We talk a lot about uh, in when we're in the field, trying to understand how has thinking changed. What do we? How do we conceive of democracy? And so often, uh, particularly in Burundi, the tenor of conversations most recently has turned to uh, economic development. You know, don't worry about elections. We don't really care very much right now about elections. What we care about is economic development so that when we have elections, we understand what it means to have a choice. Right now, we don't feel as citizens that we have any choices because we don't, we're not empowered to make choices. And it's not sort of an existential thing. It's, it's a very, it's the reality of survival that drives the average Burundian. And so if you don't know where your next meal's coming from, or if you don't understand how land reform is going to impact your ability to cultivate and what you'll eat tomorrow, uh, then the elections really are, they don't really matter. Uh, and then that's not to say that they don't matter generally, but it, when you're trying to understand how a program like this can actually begin to have impact, it, it, gives one pause, and I think we have to think much more carefully about what models and assumptions we ourselves as trainers bring into the process, f where are we speaking from, and then how do we, we understand uh, what works and what doesn't, and we, I think we need to do much more on that. I'm not sure we can provide any answers to you today, John, but I think we are trying very hard to think more carefully about that going forward. Um, and yes, I agree with John Marks that we need to do much more collaboration, and we, we have in some respects. And I think uh, many, uh, in fact, I've worked with, I've had the pleasure in the last 10 years of working with many folks from Search for Common Ground, and I think we could do a better job. Um, Peter Uben's study, the idea came up to translate and, and dramatize the interviews he did with youth and put them on radio. So that was, and so they've been working with International Alert and I believe with Search for Common Ground to do that because of that very thirst for information. Yeah. Um, Just to pick up on that, if it's okay, mm -hmm. um, I think that there's so much to do to, to 
have this co more com uh, complementarity between programs in the same country, but that should be done also across countries. I think that's the key, right? I think that, that I'm sure that many of you who are probably specialists of other countries, you see how it could be relevant, or you see also how it works in your country, and you say, well, if they did that, that would be a part of it. I think there is not enough uh, sharing of good practices, and, and, uh, and because it, they, there is also co some competition in the field for resources, right? So there is, we need to also uh, fight this risk in our field that because there is scarcity of resources, rather than even cooperating with each other, people, well, they compete, they don't want to say what we're doing, because that's what we, we are the only ones who can do. But this is so helpful to someone else, and they don't, know to, they don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'm yeah. sure that so many things you're doing, you could take it, and the same in the other way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, as John knows, uh, we, we certainly always had that in mind. Uh, Howard and I, amongst those many, many meetings we had in Burundi and around, met with every NGO in town, search no, uh, no exception, and, and consulted with you and Susan long before uh, getting in town in Burundi. Uh, so, so we think that essential for all those reasons, not to reinvent the wheel as well as trying to reinforce each other, and, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, uh, and, and thanks for that intervention. I, I don't have much more to say to, to John on, on the, except that that we always had that that in mind. Uh, your, your your very first statement was we need to rethink uh, what we mean by democracy. Uh, I mean, How, Howard and I do think that the transposing of a competitive democracy model on conflicted societies in Africa is the wrong thing to do. Uh, that we've got to start at a different point. Uh, and that's what this has all been about. And so building consensus is true. And, we, and we're still doing it. I mean, we're, we, we now, because of the success in South Africa of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we think every country has to have one. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and on and on. We decide what institutional mechanisms and everything else are, are, are right for, for this democratic transition. And, and we know in Burundi that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission isn't getting off the ground, mostly because people don't want it. They, they fear it. They, uh, they see it as irrelevant. Uh, they see it or, you know, and on and on. It, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, we absolutely agree with you. Don't have all the answers to that, but we're on the same track. <laughs> okay, next questions. I think we're getting to, uh, back to this one here. And then all right, thank you. Um, I'm Zoe Bressler with Management Systems International. Um, and yes, this model actually does resonate. We've been working for the last 10 years or so in Sierra Leone mm. on democracy building. And so um, the model is really interesting. I find it really thoughtful. And I can see in some cases where you're very brave <laughs> to be going through some of these steps with some of the folks you're talking about. Um, as I said, I have two quick questions that are, that are details about your methodology. One of them is I'm wondering how you deal with folks' accountability for their past actions. When you have folks in a room that obviously have a history with one another and obviously have some beef with one another and, and things that folks have done or not done and rumors about things, does that sit at the door? Is it somehow addressed? Um, just a couple words on, on how you deal with that. Um, and then my second question is whether you provide some kind of guidance or I don't know, some kind of essentials to the diplomats and the donors about then how to deal with um, you know, sort of post-workshop or follow-up or, you know, because, you know, everybody sort of has their opinion about, about how, to, how to be doing this. But it seems like if you're laying this important groundwork, I wonder if then you say back off in these areas or let them go in these areas or, or try not to get too much in here or do support in this way. Because um, I know that, you know, donors often, often have a, you know, some nice capital in there and some, some good incentives for people to, to do certain things. So thank you. Mm -hmm. There are a couple more. Yeah. Hi, Judy Asuni from SAIS. <clears throat> I worked for years in the Niger Delta, which is a very complex situation with a lot of external players. And Alan, you uh, hinted on this. Your left column on ownership, you talk about identifying the top leaders and the key leaders that you're going to get involved. How do you handle the issue of outsiders that is very common in a resource based conflict, like a Congo, for example? Thanks. Uh, do we have another question? No, I thought I saw a hand. Yes, Rick. Yeah, yeah hi, I'm uh, Rick Ehrenreich from State Department. And um, I guess my question is, is how have you adjusted your, um, your goals and objectives over time? Obviously, the situation today is far different than it was in 2002 when, if you win the war, I mean, mm -hmm. compared to 2002, Burundi's nirvana. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, over time, 
how have you shifted your objectives? And, uh, and clearly, um, uh, I guess one of the interesting things uh, would have been uh, August 2006 in Burundi, uh, as opposed to Kinshasa, which was also kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and still some ups and downs we're having today. Uh, most recently, I think maybe the Alexis Sindihuje situation, and just how you're sort of trying to keep things on track and um, how objectives change. Okay, thank you. Uh, don't, don't say, oh, here we go, one more. Thank you. Uh, I'm Robert Cantrell, a public opinion research analyst of all people in a place like this today. Uh, <laughs> one of the questions I'm interested in is going back to Mr. Clark's question about the issue of scale. To what extent, when you don't have interpersonal relations, which seem to be a key building block of everything you've been talking about this morning, what happens when you don't have those kinds of interpersonal relations in addition to the media? can you do to bring general publics into some kind of a process that will reconcile? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, uh, I want everyone to chip in on all these questions. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll start with, with the first one. Uh, how do we take into account the past actions? Uh, well, in, in some senses, yes, we do let it sit at the door. Uh, uh, but but the, the reason we, we bravely went into that world without quite knowing what we were doing was because in those first assessments, when we were talking to Burundians, and, and, and as, as uh, Alain was describing in more detail, we were actually asking them to give us lists of the people they thought should be in the process, et cetera. We saw names, we, we got a data, database of about 450 leaders in, in, in the first instance, after our first three months of interviews with various Burundian leaders uh, uh, inside and outside the country. Uh, and we, we saw certain names popping up over and over and over again. And, and, and so we said to ourselves, if Burundians think that these people need to be in there, even though we know they are bad guys, uh, then we need to bring them in. And, and, and we were counseled by some diplomats and others not to include a couple of key ones uh, because of their past records and things. Uh, so nothing was said about it as we went into any training. But of course, everybody knew everybody else, and they all knew their pasts. And and we certainly ran in, as as, as Alan was saying, uh, some very cold situations, tensions. Uh, and and I, I know one personalized story that, that that I witnessed was at the end of a training in Ngozi, where we had had a particular colonel who was was, was considered to possibly have been the trigger puller, but certainly involved in the, in the 1994 assassination. Uh, and, and one rebel leader uh, who at the end, when giving their commitments and talking about their, person, uh, with their experiences, the rebel leader stood up and said, on well, the first night of this workshop, I called my wife and told her not to expect me to come home. That, that this man is sitting over there, he will kill me before we leave this, this place. And so I called her tonight and we cried because this man is now my best friend. We have found a way to accommodate. And actually, as I recall, they got involved in a business interest later on, <laughs> doing some fishery work with uh, with ex-combatants on Lake Tanganyika. An amazing transformation. Uh, but but let these guys, because they dealt more with the personalities than I did. Well, I, I think what you said, Steve, was very helpful to even for me to think about it because it's it's so hard f for us in some ways, especially when they one of the participants comes and tells you their vision of a person. <coughs> I mean, first, it's, it's very problematic, right? And, 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 and shaking hands with this person, as we always do, we do with everyone, is a major problem. But it is, at, at the end, it's what you do with that. Because you could say, well, my conscience, I have a major problem with my conscience. But it's, it's, the problem is that you should not be a problem for the people in the room. If they have enough problems, not to add your own problem, right? I'm not saying I have no problem, but I, but I should not burden the people with that ethical dilemma that I have in my head. But there's a way of using that as an incredible tool. Because, uh, of course, uh, as when you were talking about it, I was seeing myself in that situation. What do I do after a coffee break when someone has told me that? Because if I do nothing with it, what I'm saying is I don't care the way a victim feels about someone who may have committed some acts of genocide, which is how could I do that, right? How can I acknowledge the victim or someone who feels a victim? And I'm not there to even try to do joint fact-finding. It's not the place to do that, right? 
So uh, there is a way of, of using that in a very powerful way. And I, have, I remember some scenes after a coffee break when I said, this is not easy for you to be here. From what you tell me sometimes, it is not easy for you to be here. You don't even want maybe to be with a person on the other side and, and with af after what happened, I can understand that. Right? There is a lot of suffering around this table. So you see what I'm saying? And I'm, uh, there is a way of even that can be a powerful tool <laughs> for people. It's a, all a matter of acknowledgement. I hear what some people have said. I don't need to say, you said that, he's, you said that about him, which would be stupid to say that, right? And irrelevant. But saying I, 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 with the eyes, I can look at you during, and then you know I'm talking about you, in a way, right? But I don't need to talk about you, and I know you're talking about him, right? But you feel acknowledged. And everyone in the room has some stories of their own pains and suffering. Even that guy who was the head of security, who a lot of people hated, when he told me one day, right, and, and maybe they are playing, and they're playing, they can be good at playing games with you, right? Right? Uh, the, the worst tortures would be the worst, the best at telling you there are angels at the end, right? Which is a very dangerous situation for you as a facilitator. But he would tell me, you know, I was, uh, this two, I was uh, the only Tutsi in my group were at school, right? And all the others were always doing, th doing that to me in the, when I was si seven or eight, saying, Tutsi, 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 right? So, and of course, what's the, what's the link between that and what we are talking about? The link is that this guy had been humiliated for years, and this is true. When suddenly he had the power, he abused the power he had. And, but the, and, and I, I don't justify what he did. There is no way of justifying what he may have done afterwards. But unfortunately, we know why it happened, right? If there is a community that is humiliated, whatever it is, which w whatever, whichever it can be, you created so very dangerous people afterwards, and, and, and there is a lot of suffering going on. So, but you see, you can, acknowledge, you can say that. You can say that to people. The, the whole question, you need to, be, to, to feel true to yourself when you're saying that. I don't know if it makes any sense what I said. I won't add to that. Just on your second question about uh, donors, I think the one, certainly in Burundi, and I know it's happened uh, in Congo as well, but uh, we've been very fortunate to have worked with some individuals within donor agencies that are actually quite interested in, in what has happened uh, and why and what the successes are. And when Steve mentioned uh, the need to improve monitoring and evaluation, certainly that always comes from donors, but it, it also, it's been a, a better dialogue than I might have anticipated at first. And I know that um, our work uh, certainly, uh, we've been, had less funding certainly in Burundi from USAID, but a lot of funding from DFID. Mm -hmm. And that is one agency that is very interested in understanding how their future, their funding of future programming might be influenced by what's happening now. Um, that just happens to be the way they work, and certainly the individuals on the ground in, in Burundi were quite conscious of that. So I think um, they were particularly interested in how what we were doing might influence other, other programming. And on that question as well, uh, to add to Liz's, uh, How Howard and I, uh, whenever one or both of us travel through the country, always meet with donors. Mm -hmm. uh, We've had the luxury in Burundi of ha always having an American ambassador who would kind of host meetings for us and bring everybody around. Uh, uh, that's been off and on in DRC, but still basically we follow that pattern. And, and, and the purpose was to brief him on, on where we're at and how it's going, what the impact is we see. And, and it's, it's, it's sporadic, uh, but it's regular enough that, that we keep them on board. Uh, we keep them informed. We began the process long before we began the training and, and just meeting with donors and, and getting their input and, and et cetera. Now, obviously, it, it's somewhat self-serving because then when we uh, approach them later for, for hopefully some funds to continue, uh, that will be helpful. But we try to follow up with them constantly, even if they, and when I say donors, I don't just mean those we have grants from. Yeah, no, no. I, the entire diplomatic community and everyone who's represented there, yes. Or maybe both the question on outsiders and shift of objectives, because I think it's, they, they are somehow linked. Um, in in <coughs> DR Congo, for example, uh, as I think Steve explained very well, it started as a national program, but very quickly people said, well, it's great what you're doing in Kinshasa, but the problem is in Goma and Bukavu. 
and now more in Goma, right? Um, so I think that though we had other plans at the beginning, it shifted to uh, Kivus. And, and it has been, because that's the crisis intervention mm -hmm. thing, it is much more on the Kivus uh, than about Congo, because that's where the problem is. And, and, let's, and I want to now go to the outsider's question. So we had to downscale, if you wish, the program to a province or two provinces for Congo. But also people said, well, it's, it's great that you're bringing all the Congolese around the table, but it's not simply about Congolese. Right? So you see, it's a, both a question of reducing and then suddenly saying, well, it's also about the quadripartite commission and it's about uh, Uganda, it's about uh, Rwanda and all of these people have a contribution possibly to the solution, right? So I think that th there, is a, there is an issue there that you can't, I mean, we, you can't continue to ignore what participants are telling you. Of course, it's also part of the myth that the problem is the outsider, right? Because that's a great way of saying it serious. is not us, right? It, there is no problem in Congo. The problem is our uh, neighbors, right? I think it's always more complicated than that. But you can't ignore if that's the perceptions of people and you need to, and that's what everyone is working on, I know that, right? At some point, these, the high leaders, uh, security leaders and, and political leaders of these different countries must get together also as part of a process. It, so that was very important. So outsiders need to be involved in the conversa conversation as long as the participants themselves think it is important because sometimes they don't if you said you would do that they would say why you want interference of a neighbor in in our affairs but they want it so it's very different this is that that's how it is right because it's it is a, a partisan driven process in that sense um, to add just a little bit to, to fred's question i i think there has been a, a certainly in burundi a sign significant shifts over time in, in the adjustment of goals um, and objectives. And I think uh, some of that has been driven by, the, the original program was post-conflict tran transition. How do you, how do you tran go from the, the sort of buyoya ndaizei to then the preparation for the elections, then moving to more institutional reform, so then deciding because the participants themselves said that that's what they wanted to do, recalibrating and thinking, okay, well, what does that mean? Where do we need to focus our resources? Who will fund it? Uh, great, the Army Chief of Staff said he'd like a program with the Army, but uh, that's not currently being paid for under the current grant, et cetera. So um, responding to participants has been a way we, that we've adjusted. Um, I think the other challenge has been, and if you're in the training field, right, if you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So training is the solution, right? So we're conflict resolution trainers, if you will, negotiation trainers. So therefore, we want to design conflict resolution training programs. That's such a great solution to all these opportunities. And I think we've actually been pretty good about taking a step back and trying to have very explicit conversations about that. So when opportunities arise, is it that we're the best organizations to be involved or do you pass those opportunities off to organizations that are actually better positioned to to take on some of the, the requests? Uh, if it's looking at parliament and, and trying to think about how parliament might function more effectively, certainly there's probably some aspect of that that better communication skills uh, might serve and we can add to that program, but it might be an NDI or an IRR that actually comes in and has much more experience than we do uh, on actually helping parliaments function more effectively. Uh, and then it's, it's so to have a much more explicit conversation about what the problems are and then what kinds of solutions might be uh, most appropriate. So that, that's been a challenge that I think we've, uh, we're managing. Uh, it's hard not, of course, to come to the table and say, oh, well, training would be really good for, for this problem. Um, uh, I, I think the the BLTP itself, because people have come to that, the BLTP meaning the NGO that now exists uh, in Burundi, because folks come from such varied backgrounds, they're not, they didn't start out as conflict resolution trainers, so they have different contacts, different networks, and they bring a different perspective to what might be appropriate, how to make the choices on where to focus next. And that's actually led 
to probably some deepening of our involvement on dialogue, which is different than training. So literally looking at facilitating dialogue processes mm -hmm. um, as, it, and that means maybe a less of a role for us. Okay, that that's what's necessary if that's where they are deciding they're going and that's where they feel it's it's most appropriate to, to focus their own resources. So it's understanding how that also that relationship can be be managed so that we continue to support the BLTP without trying to force them in one d direction or another. Um, and I think. Yes, definitely August 2006. In fact, that's what I thought Alain was going when he said August 2006. Uh, uh, I, and then he brought up Congo, so it was very, it was a hot time in the region in general. Um, and I, yeah, the question of Alexi, for example, who is a journalist who's been imprisoned uh, in, in Burundi, uh, along with several others. So I think Alexi has a very high profile, and they're, although his case is not frankly, very different, unfortunately, from many others who've been in prison. It's, it's a, he's a political prisoner, most certainly, and uh, we'll see what happens. How these kinds of programs can respond to those, I think you need to get your cues from Burundians themselves about where to focus energies. And I think right now, most Burundians would tell you they want the FNL back in like truly participating, the last remaining rebel group, truly participating in government. Mm -hmm. And that is a higher priority than dealing with the political prisoners at this time. So it's interesting. It's easy to get very excited about particular issues when we're far away and reading the headlines. Um, and then it's important to go back and speak to those on the ground to, to make sure that we're allocating the limited resources that we have in the direction that Burundians think are, is the most effective, if you will. Uh, to pick up on that thought on the uh, on Rick's question, um, the uh, first of all, we aren't an advocacy group. Advocacy group, uh, obviously, uh, we're trying to work with people to make, help them to help themselves make these transitions. Uh, and and Alexi's situation, a person who we know very well, is is one that we're sympathetic about, and 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 may in our own institutions in our personal way try to respond and affect that. Uh, but in terms of our training, we have to respond to you know to donor resources to perceived needs. Uh, Burundi is a very good example of how that's happened. I mean, the FNL question that Liz brings up uh, from the very beginning, and that goes all the way back to 2002 and 3. We tried to get the FNL into our training, and they they refused for a variety of reasons. Although we had long conversations over the years with them. Um, now it's being actively explored with uh, with Yusuf Mahmoud and uh, Bainoub and uh, and and with Agatan Rawaza directly uh, to uh, to uh, begin training with them probably in the context of the verification and monitoring commission, uh, uh, but to, to work with the FNL. Uh, we had basically stopped working with political parties from about 2007 onward. We'd focused on the security sector reform, the training of trainers, issues that Liz had been talking about, uh, 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 and, and that was an identified need and an important need, uh, but now suddenly with things at such a stalemate, we're being talked to again about, and, and, a, and a donor potentially talking to us about coming in to do some work as we did before the 2005 elections with the uh, with the CINE, with the Independent Electoral Commission and, and political parties again now. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, when are we supposed to leave? 11.30 or 12? Oh, I thought we were going to 12. Yep. Hey, we've taken it over. I want to get to one question, though, that uh, that we uh, haven't uh, touched at all. Uh, I mean, uh, on Judy's question, uh, not much more to add to Alain, except that we also, from time to time, very selectively, will bring outsiders in as observers in our trainings. Uh, to, 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 oh, to I'm sorry, I mean, maybe I, I misunderstood yeah, to, the to question. Both, to both oh, witness and, and no, 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 you didn't misunderstand the question. You made a good answer. This is additional. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and so we... we, 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 we uh, we have to do that selectively, obviously. Uh, in terms of scale and the interpersonal relations and how that, uh, uh, it's absolutely true that going into Burundi and into the DRC, the key to our original success, the key to it being able to happen at all was Howard Wolpe. Uh, and this unusual set of circumstances which gave, which gave him access, trust, uh, relationships at the highest levels from all parties to those, those struggles. Uh, and so we could have very frank and open conversations with him and, 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 and some, sometimes just his presence and, and gravitas and reputation and stuff was enough to, to bring them into the process. That doesn't work anywhere else. Uh, even in Liberia, a place that both Howard and I know pretty well and worked in in the past, uh, we had to, to go through a, a different entry point, uh, the United Nations. So, so that has to be rethought through 
any kind of intervention you will make. Uh, a lot of people, I mean, over the years, uh, I, when talking about this program, people will say, well, why don't you work in Iraq? You know, why aren't you working in Afghanistan? Uh, I, I wouldn't dismiss the fact that this could be useful in an Iraq and in Afghanistan and almost anywhere else, but it would have to be done in a very, very different way, a different, very different point of access uh, under the, some different auspices. Uh, it might be institutional, World Bank, United Nations, whatever, uh, but it just has to be rethought yeah. entirely. I think we're going to have to end there. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I mistook. I thought we were going until 12. I didn't realize it was 11.30. Thank you very much. Thank our panel.